the Borgias is about power. The Borgias were one of the most powerful, bloodthirsty, immoral bunch in medieval Italy. We shall subdue the arrogance of those papal states one by one. Poison! God will forgive us, my son, but I will not forgive failure. Power in the time of the Borgias was generally achieved through marital alliances, through military conquest, or through the new power of banking, which made all of these wars possible. In fact, to be a great Italian house, you needed to bring those three things together. You needed wealth, you needed connections, and you needed force to be able to back up your reputation, to be able to back up your honor. The vultures are circling our family. We must protect ourselves. In the Renaissance, Italy is a jigsaw of different political kind of states and different kinds of political units. Here is the tiny city of Rome, surrounded by the Papal States. Now, its rule is small, but its power is great. The Papal States were a series of provinces that were ruled by different families, all of whom imagined they themselves had a right to the papacy. These are families who detest each other, who've been fighting a feud that has gone on for generations in the streets of Rome at this period. There's a huge amount of vicious brawling, there's a large amount of political murder that's happening because of the hatred between these families. You are either with us or against us. Church is immensely powerful. The Pope is both head spiritually of the church, so he has universal authority over the whole of Europe, but he also has very vested political interests in that central area around St. Peter's. And what's striking about Rodrigo Borgia is that when he becomes Pope, he wants to take these lands back under direct control. We have unleashed a wolf upon this world, and if we do not act, he will consume us all. It's rumored that up to four cardinals were poisoned by Borgia as part of his way of eliminating his enemies. It's not just that he wants them out of the way, but he wants their wealth and their goods. Also, the church is selling a sort of speeded up passport to heaven. You could buy blessings in the afterlife by buying these indulgences, and the money from these indulgences were then used to build up the church back in Rome. God's blessing comes with a price. So the popes are immensely powerful, both universally as heads of the church, but also within Rome and that immediate area. And they're trying to create that area around Rome, a state worthy of their spiritual office. We will restore Rome to its former glory. Under the Borgias, it shall shine as it did beneath the Caesars. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Oh, vengeance will be ours. War in the time of the Borgias was endemic. Whether it was nobles in search of honor, whether it was kings in search of land, whether it was mercenaries in search of profit, war was a fact of daily life in Renaissance Italy. The papacy was always involved in wars and in chaos and in bloodshed. You have a plan. We fight fire with fire. It's not like the modern pope at all to give an order to have a castle taken or to have prisoners killed would be a military order. He would not think twice about as pope. We will excommunicate Florence if the French armies are admitted. Charles VIII, very ugly, stuttering king, decides that he's going to try and claim the kingdom of Naples. When the French army came through Milan and into Florence, the Italians were so terrified that they bowed down in front of them. Rome capitulates, and Naples falls within three weeks. It's a lightning assault. And if anything, it also marks a revolution in modern warfare, because the French are coming with equipment and with troops, the likes of which have not been seen in Italy for a long time. We have our own invention, chained cannonballs. <laughs> The cannon is important, but it's important because it's part of a bigger gunpowder revolution. The cannon, the handgun. Gunpowder. The size of armies are increasing in this period, and it also means that tactics is becoming more important. To be a great leader is not to be up there at the front, it's to work out where to place your troops. It's to think much more strategically about the battlefield as a whole. The Roman genius is for strategy and rapid movement. Let us use it to the full and annihilate those 
French barbarians with their lumbering metal cannon. So while humanists might say that war is a madness, war is a shame to Christian civilization, actually the lords of the Renaissance are incredibly bloodthirsty, and war is everywhere in Europe around 1500. <laughs> was this tiny little kind of crumbling piece of ancient history. There were animals grazing in the street. There were um, bandits. It wasn't a place you wanted to go very much. Street fighting in every corner, 7,000 prostitutes. It's a very dangerous kind of city. Restore Rome to its former glory. Let Rome be full of joy. This is clearly one of the most exciting turning points in European history. 1492, Columbus discovers the American continent. This savage brought back by Christopher Columbus from the new continent. Yes, Your Holiness. This is also, of course, the period of enormous cultural and creative outpourings. We've got the Gutenberg Press, which means that by 1500, there were as many as six million printed books in circulation. And this is also the great age of the High Renaissance, that the best artists from all over the country are being drawn towards one place. One requested Leonardo. And you wisely declined. Uh, we have not yet acquired the wealth of a Florentine bank. The Renaissance obviously means rebirth. You know, the term is to do with the rediscovery of arts and letters from antiquity. That contrasts very dramatically with the brutality of the Renaissance. This is a period of incredible ruthlessness, incredible political kind of suspicion and paranoia, and where war was a constant fact of life. The average citizen in Rome in this period, most of the diet was rather meager, personal hygiene was pretty much non-existent, this is a period where plague is rife, decimating Italian towns. This is a period in which life is very precarious. And so one way to think about the Borgias is they're trying to restore Rome to be a city that's really worthy of being the head of the world. Another Borgias, it will shine as it did beneath the Caesars. It's Alexander who carves up the new world. He took worldly dynastic concerns far more seriously than he took his spiritual offices. That was because he was trying to protect Rome. He was trying to build up the papacy in a time of danger. His grand project, basically, is to get his family to dominate the, the politics of central Italy, you know, to carve out a kingdom for themselves. And actually, he was a man whose main sin, really, was the overlove of his family. But if we are to achieve this greatness, your birthright, it will be together as one as family. Church is immensely powerful. The Pope is both head spiritually of the church, so he has universal authority over the whole of Europe, but he also has very vested political interests in that central area around St. Peter's. And what's striking about Rodrigo Borgia is that when he becomes Pope, he wants to take these lands back under direct control. Cardinal Della Rovere is still alive. I would hardly call it living. It's rumored that up to four cardinals were poisoned by Borgia as part of his way of eliminating his enemies. It's not just that he wants them out of the way, he wants their wealth and their goods. Also, the church is selling a sort of speeded up passport to heaven. You could buy blessings in the afterlife by buying these indulgences, and the money from these indulgences were then used to build up the church back in Rome. It is ingenious when you think of it. The faithful pay to maintain it in its magnificence. But the Pope's main power actually was the granting of divorces. Any time the King of England, the King of France, the King of Spain wanted to get rid of their wife or their husband or stuff, that's when the Pope came into his own. He says, OK, I'll give you a divorce, but you're going to give me this or that. God's blessing comes with a price. Louis XII wants to get rid of his wife. 
Pope Alexander realizes he wants this new French king as an ally, so he's willing to grant the divorce. And he sends Cesare up to France in order to kind of broker it. And as a result, the French then support Cesare when he's going in and clearing the papal states of the Pope's enemies. You are either with us or against us. So the popes are immensely powerful, both universally as heads of the church, but also within Rome and that immediate area. And they're trying to create that area around Rome, a state worthy of their spiritual office. We begin battle with the cannon. The cannon? Yes. Never risk a man until you've used your artillery. The cannon is important, but it's important because it's part of a bigger gunpowder revolution. It's the cannon, it's the handgun. Gunpowder. The size of armies are increasing in this period, and it also means that tactics is becoming more important. To be a great leader is not to be up there at the front, it's to work out where to place your troops. It's to think much more strategically about the battlefield as a whole. We have our own invention, chained cannonballs. Cannons have been used for about 100 years or so before, but certainly the kind of technology has become much more refined, and it's also much more mobile. One of the things that King Charles does is he uses horses to pull the cannon, and he's also using iron balls, which means that it can very quickly blast through castle defences. And so it's the challenge of cannon, really, that means that in lots of ways, people have to come up with new ideas about how to defend fortifications and how to defend towns to begin with. You have a plan. We fight fire. Fire. Because of the effectiveness of the cannon, Europeans start designing their castles differently. So rather than just having one wall, you have a kind of multi-sided structure with thicker walls, with sloping walls that are better at repelling artillery. Similarly, they start investing in plate armor, which is much better at deflecting bullets and musket shot uh, than previous forms of armament. So, but it takes a while for these new tactics to develop. Love in the time of the Borgias was far more of an emotional luxury than it might be today. Marriage was essentially about property alliances, and love was a thing that was seen to start after marriage rather than preceding it. Lucrezia must marry. She is just a child. We must bind our enemies to us, make friends of them. The women have very little control themselves over who they marry. Girls tend to be married as teenagers. Many men are married in their 30s. And as a result, there's a long period for a man to sow his wild oats before he settles down to a wife. Within the household, the wife is completely subordinate to the husband, and there are constant sermons encouraging wives to be meek, to be submissive, to be obedient. I mean, the double standard is ubiquitous in this period. What do you know of marriage, Francesca? It should not be thus. Within church teaching, divorce was illegal and would remain illegal really until the French Revolution. The idea being that when two individuals came together, they created a new spiritual person who was a single individual and couldn't be separated. And so at best, rather than a divorce, what you were getting was an annulment or a separation so that individuals could go their separate ways. But divorce as a concept didn't exist. Within church teaching, sex should only be happening within marriage. Sex was about creation of new life. That said, you only have to look outside of those teachings to realize that sexual practices are much more ambiguous than we'd imagine. Illegitimate children were tolerated. There was very little stigma on illegitimacy, uh, which shows that people clearly were having sex outside of marriage. Don't you want them to hear that you have a new heart? If you think of God's purposes as being about the creation of new life, sexual practices which made that new life impossible such as same-sex relationships, was seen as bestial. And in fact, sodomy was treated in the same sort of breath as bestiality or incest. And frequently, sodomites are blamed for the plague, they're blamed for earthquakes. There's a way in which sodomy is seen as such an abomination that God is punishing man uh, for allowing this to go on in their midst. <coughs> you pain, son. Prostitution was tolerated officially by the Vatican because it was seen as better than sodomy. Some of these were very wealthy courtesans, others were prostitutes who were working in public baths. Can I help you, ladies? We're in search of cardinals. Uh, well, you've come to the right place then. But essentially, the prostitute's life was a precarious one. I mean, she's frequently denounced, and yet she has influence with various noble families. You have a priest for a brother? A cardinal. A cardinal? I should have charged you double. I imagine you did. 
It's also in this period that syphilis, of course, comes to Europe for the first time, a disease that's terrifying because it seems to be incurable. Not good. In fact, very bad. It's extremely plausible that members of the noble, like Juan, uh, Alexander's son, could have contracted syphilis. Most of the nobles have to rely basically on magical cures, on astrological kind of advice. They start using mercury as a way of treating syphilis. Mercury. Or rather, the corrosive sublimit is indicated. Although mercury, whether rubbed into the body or injected into the body, led to large number of cases of lead poisoning. And so even the very rich remain very vulnerable over the 16th century. <laughs>